Okay, guys, we're gonna begin. Bokashem. I've been here in America for two weeks. I've had the schut to travel around the country, and by that I mean to two different states. <laughs> I was in, or maybe three. I was in Highland Park in New Jersey when I first got here. And we did Lakut El Achot, which is Rabbi Nachman's main student, Rav Natan. He wrote this magnum opus called Lakut El Achot, and we did that together, and it was amazing. And from there, we went to five towns where they were doing a Lakut Imran Chabur over there. And I had the schut to go meet a bunch of new guys who were amazing. One of them is uh, one of their fathers, which is pretty cool. And now their daughter is uh, here learning as well, which is really amazing. Um, Torah is supposed to be a blessing that goes from parents to children. That's when the Torah says there's shalom, there's peace. So this is a big schut for me. And then I was able to go down to Miami to do a podcast with Gedalia Fenster. Yes, he is in that good of shape in real life as well. Um, it's always good to be put in check, you know, see where you're holding physically over there, which was good. You guys can check out that podcast if you want. It's very interesting. And then I was able to come back here and to do uh, Shabbos in the Five Towns with Rev Weinberger to speak by his kahila and speak to him about the breasts of yeshiva and the people there. And I was able to speak in a few different places. It was amazing. And then, Boga Shem, I was able to come home to Queens to spend time with my Bukharian brothers. And uh, we're going to finish where we started. Until the next time, Bezrat Hashem. So tonight's class is a very difficult topic. It's difficult because nobody has an answer. How do you find Hashem when you can't find Hashem? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Woo! Enjoy it. Good. You guys enjoyed? No? Neil, you didn't sit down yet? Sorry, I was trying to get you in your seat already. You're just tallying along over there. Um, when the Jewish people received the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu went all the way up the mountain. Yeshua was right beneath him. You had Aaron and Cohen. You had the Kanim. These were the elders. And then you had the Jewish people at the bottom of the mountain. Rabbi Nachman asks, why is Moshe Rabbeinu the only one who went to the top? The Torah says that at the top of the mountain, it was incredibly dark. It was like pure pitch darkness. Moshe was the only one who went all the way up to the top, Rabbi Nachman says, because he was the only one who knows that God's there also. Everyone else hopes he's there. Moshe actually knows he's there. In the beginning of Sichot Aran, which is Rabbi Nachman's conversations, which it says in the Gemara that even basic conversations of Sadiqim are worth tremendous study. And in fact, one of Rabbi Nachman's students, 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 his name was Rabbi Avram Rabbi Nachman, he wrote a perush on the Kutz Maran, which is mind blowing. His father was the main student of Rabbi Natan. And this person, Rav Avram, Rav Nachman, said, If I spent thousand years in Gan Eden, I'll advise that I should understand one basic conversation Rabbi Nachman had with anybody. Not his Torahs, not his lessons, not his chizuk, but literally a basic conversation he had with another human being, that in this place of Gan Eden, Alavai that he should spend a thousand years there and he could actually understand one of those basic conversations. The first one is in Sichot Aran. And he brings this pasuk from King David. King David says, Ani Yadati, I know. And he speaks about how great God is. But if you know a little bit of Hebrew, which I don't, but if you did, Abraham can help me out with this, you don't need to say Ani Yadati. You can just say Yadati. Yadati means I know. Why Ani Yadati? And if I'm wrong, please don't correct me because it's embarrassing for me. Okay? Why Ani Yadati? Rabbi Nachman says, because King David sang, only I know. 
Me and only me. Why is Rabbi Nachman starting like that? He's trying to clue you into the power of this figure which is called Moshe, who we call the Tzadik Yesod Olam. That as opposed to all the Tzadikim and all the Jewish people who believe and they hope that Hashem is in the darkness, only Moshe can say, Ani Yadati, I actually know he's there. And the proof is that when he went to the highest part of the mountain, in which it was pure pitch darkness, Moshe went straight up there. And what did he receive in that place? He received the Torah. So right now we should have an amazing, unbelievable chizik from this. And that is, one, thank God we have a figure like Moshe in our generation, who says, Ani Yadati, I also know that Hashem's in the darkness. And I've been there. And I also brought down Torah from that place. But on top of that, the fact that the Torah actually comes from that place specifically. You could not get the Torah anywhere where there was light. You could only get the Torah in complete, utter darkness. And that's where Moshe received it from. Now why is this so important for us? Because Rabbi Nachman says as well in Sichot Aran, there's a flood coming. Not a flood of a lack of physical needs, which we've had problems with this for thousands of years. Do I have enough water? Do I have what to eat? Do I have a house? Do I have this? Rabbi Nachman says there's coming a time you're not going to have a problem with any of that. There's another flood coming. It's a flood of atheism. Now, if we saw what he said then, now, we'd be like, okay, great, obviously the whole world doesn't believe in God. We learned about science, and we have all types of philosophical understanding we didn't have before, psychological understanding, sociological understanding. So obviously, atheism is naturally going to spread throughout the world, because all of these things seem to conclude there is no God. But none of those things existed when Rabbi Nachman was alive. So how does Rabbi Nachman know that atheism is about to spread throughout the whole world? Because Ani Yadati, I know. Me and only me. And he said, the fact that I'm predicting it for you is not going to make it any easier. But it should give you chizik to know that somebody predicted it. And we're all living in that time. We're all living in that place. And when a person hears that, they might say to themselves, but I'm not in that category. Baruch Hashem, I'm Bukharian, I'm Sephardic. And just like I know I can make a lot of money on 47th Street, I also know God exists. And I don't need a proof for that. Nobody needs to prove it to me. Comes Rabbi Nachman to say, you also have atheism inside of you. And what about rabbis? That they wear black coats and nice big hats. And their whole life is dedicated to Hashem. And they learn Yom Valayla all day and night. Rabbi Nachman says, guess what? The flood doesn't stop here. It goes to you also. Everyone's going to be contending with this flood. Rabbi Nachman brings the fact that there are seven versions of the Yetzirah that are brought down in Masechet Sukkot about every generation has their own version of the force of negativity which disconnects you from God, disconnects you from having that experience where you can know Hashem. And it's called different things in the Gemara. And Rabbi Nachman says, in this final generation, there's going to be a version of the Yetzirah that isn't even in the Gemara. It's called Koach Medameh, the power of your own imagination. Why is this so much more difficult than all the other versions? Because when your enemy is outside of you, you know who he is, right? If I know that Benny's out to get me, and every moment I see him, you know, he's got his fanny pack inside there, he's got a whole checklist of everything I did to him. When he wants to get excited, he just goes through it. Did this to me, did this to me, did, oh, okay, okay, oh yeah, oh yeah, all right, I'm coming, no problem. But at least I know to avoid Benny. But what if Benny's in my head? <laughs> what if my thoughts are called Benny? 
How do I avoid that? How do I overcome that? What if my greatest enemy is in my own imagination? And all of these thoughts that I think are absolutely true, they must be, they are the way that I have conceived of all of my life. All of those thoughts are based on, rooted in the power of my own imagination. Rabbi Nachman said at the end of his life, there's one thing that I know for sure I did with you, meaning my students. And also that means anybody who will be a student in the future who will dedicate his life to these teachings, to his advice, to his unique pathway. That which I know with my das, you all can intuit through your powers of imagination. Which means what? Something that's very scary. We don't see the world through our mind. We see the world through our imagination. And therefore, to the degree that your imagination is pure, to that degree, you can actually conceive reality as it is. Now, if you look at all the mental health rates that have skyrocketed in the past however many decades in America, you would say on paper, this doesn't make any sense. If anybody should not be dealing with depression or anxiety, it's people who physically, for the first time, have everything. Why is it that for thousands of years, we're chasing after those things, and there's very low rates of sadness? And anxiety. Why is it that only now, when you're just deciding not how, not one car, which car, but how many cars? Not if I'll have a house, but how many houses? Not if I'm going to eat tonight, how many plates? What are we scared about? What are we nervous about? What are we so worried about? Nothing. It's called imagination. Rabbi Nachman said, but I know that God's there. I know it. And I'm going to give you a way to connect there. So number one, we're going to go through a list of basic actionable steps that you can do and take in order to find Hashem when you can't find Hashem. Number one, you must learn Breslov Hasidus. I don't know why you guys are laughing. <laughs> Listen, I'm only here for two weeks. It's not like when I was here before and I had to like, yeah, you know, learn Hasidus, it's all good. And then hopefully one day after you're with me for weeks, it's just obvious to you. I'm obviously speaking about one person. I have one night with you, okay? I'm being totally straight up with you. When you learn any books... You know, someone once came to Rav Chaim Kramer and said, Ah, you crazy people, you leave your families to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, that's insane, you're obsessed with this figure, he's not alive, X, Y, and Z, dot, 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 dot. So Rav Chaim Kramer said back to him, Listen, we could have a conversation from today until tomorrow. I'm just going to have you try and exercise yourself, and then we'll talk after that. What was the exercise? I want you to pick five books. Any five books you want. But one of those books has to be a book of Breast of Hasidus. After you read those five books, I want you to come back to me and tell me, honestly, which one of those far and which one of those books made you feel closer to God. few months later, this person calls back and says, can you book me a ticket to Uman for Rosh Hashanah? He gives a Lakuta Moran Kabura now for years, this person. I'm sure he's also donated a lot of money to their organization. What's the point? The proof is in the pudding. There's many amazing teachings that are available in Judaism and Torah and especially Hasidus. And they take tremendous amount of work to be able to experience what's in that book. And while the same is true for Breslov Hasidus, it has an additional benefit of even if you have not done any of that work, and you simply open up the book, you will be transported to a place of feeling Hashem's love for you. You will be knocked into experience of feeling like God is there. 
So therefore, if you cannot find Hashem in your life, first of all, it's normal. Because we're in a generation where Rabbi Nachman says, Aster, Aster Panai, based on this Pasuk, I'm going to hide myself doubly. Which means that Hashem is not only going to be hiding, He's going to be hiding the fact that He's hiding. So if you know He's hiding, that's already painful enough. Now imagine you don't even know He's hiding. And that's the cause of all your problems. Where do you even start? Rabbi Nachman says, I got you. Because I see that Hashem is in the dark. And in fact, not is He only in the dark. The highest revelation of God is in that Hastar Shabbatoch Hastar. So number one, have a time every day that you learn some form of rest of Hasidus. Now, you should know, after I tell you this, if you get excited about it, you will have people telling you, Ah! Breslov, really? Okay, it's nice, come on, you're not a kid anymore, you're 40 now, you're 50 now, you're 30 now. Come on, Gemara, Halakha, let's go, time to move on. You need to know that this is the Sitra Akra. <laughs> Rabbi Nachman says, you will have maniyot, you will have obstacles to drawing close to the tzaddik, and they will not just come from people who you don't expect, they will also come from your loved ones. And even in that case, you have to overcome. Avram is a echad, he's one. What does it mean he's one? It means that Rabbi Nachman teaches every single one of us needs to know that we are one with God. And you have to picture your whole life as if it's just you and Hashem. And even my relationship with my spouse, even my kids, my parents, my family, my friends, my rebellion, those who are close to me. You should always do everything you can to maintain peace with those people who love you, to have beautiful relationships with those people who are close to you. It's a mitzvah gedola to pursue peace. But you can't have peace if you don't have truth. So no matter how much peace that you're trying to invest in, if you leave truth behind, whatever peace you find is not peace at all. They have 200 years worth of history of people believing in these teachings very, very much, having their own family members say, no, really, I don't think so. Them being persistent and continuing anyway, and everybody around them at some point saying, you're right, I'm sorry. And if you never do that, you never get to the point where they say that to you. It's not an easy road. The people who were close to Moshe in the generation of the Midbar, it wasn't easy to be Moshe's student. They were saying that Moshe was sleeping with everybody's wife. They were saying that Moshe was a power monger, a fear monger. He was trying to do X, Y, and Z. The same person who literally took them out of slavery after 200 years. His own family members were saying things about Moshe. Rabbi Nachman teaches that a Muna in God comes with your journey with the Tzaddik. And the only way you get to full belief in God is if you do not Give up on your belief in the Rebbe. They go together. When the ocean split and we said, Az Yashir, it said we believe in Hashem and we believe in Moshe, his servant. They're not two different things. Moshe is the one who brings you Hashem. Okay? So therefore, when you hear from other people not to learn this, before you just act on that, you have to go back on your own and remember... When did I feel closest to Hashem? What makes me feel closest to God? And if the answer is those books, you must read them. And not just sometimes, and not just when you need chizik. You have to be proactive, not reactive. The Gemara says with your Yetzirah, you have to incite him. Not just have him come to you and you respond. Now yes, if you need help and you need to respond, you must do that also. But if you want to thrive with these teachings, 
if you want to live with these teachings, if you want to give them over to your spouse, to your kids, to your community, you cannot be a passive recipient of them. You need to actively run after them. That means having a time every day you learn them. There is Lakuta Moran, there is Lakuta El Achot, there is Chaya Moran, there is Alim Tarufa, there is Yemei Moranot. There are number of countless abreslive books and every single person has their own unique connection to all of them. So, find out the one that makes you feel closest to God and have a time every day that you look at it. That's number one, okay? You will see right away when you start doing this, you feel God every day. And when you don't do it, you will wonder where God is. That's number one. Number two, in the second section of the Quran, the tenth lesson, there are two main lessons in the Quran that Rabbi Nachman says are the most fundamental. Now they're all fundamental, but these are the two that really you can't live without them. One of them most people know, which we're going to speak about after this, is called the Zamra. The Zamra means, I'm going to sing to God, Be'odi, which is with the little bit, which Rabbi Nachman translates literally, with the little bit. Rabbi Nachman says, what's the little bit? That little bit of good that's inside of me. We're going to get there in a second. But before we get there, there's another side of the spectrum, which is not to find Hashem through that little bit of good, but when I can't find anything, what do I do? This is the 10th lesson of Tinyana. Rabbi Nachman says you should scream out, Ayem akom kivoda. Where the heck are you? Where are you? Where are you? When you're playing hide and go seek with somebody and you can't find them, what do you do? What do you say? Where are you? You say, Moshe, where are you? Avi, where are you? You say their name. You say, Miriam, where are you? Rabbi Nachman brings down in the 56th lesson of the Kutu Moran that the way that you find Hashem through the Hastar Shabbatoh Hastar is that you need to say His name. Because that's how you find somebody that you can't find. You call out their name. And in this lesson that we're speaking about specifically, when Hashem is very, very hidden that you don't see Him at all, you must not just say, you need to literally scream out, Ayeh, where are you? Ayeh is, according to Gavala, one of God's names. It's related to the Keter, the crown. Now again, this is related back to what we were saying before. If you go through the ten Sfirot, or you go through the worlds, the higher up you go, the more hidden God gets. So even though Hashem, so to speak, is more present in those places, the more hidden He becomes. When you get to the highest level, which is called Keter, the crown, He is completely, totally hidden. At that point, He's called Atik, the Ancient One. Ancient means like you don't see Him anywhere. He's very old in that place. He's also called Satum, concealed, closed. But on the other hand, the highest place is the greatest revelation of God. So Rabbi Nachman says to you, you're thinking that when you can't find Hashem, that means that I am the furthest that I could possibly be from Him. And you're wrong. The more easily that Hashem is revealed to you, the lower of a revelation of God that is. The more that He's hidden from you, the greater and the more intense that Hashem is there, but in a more concealed way. How do you find Him in that place? By screaming, I am Akom Kivoda, where are you? In fact, if you look at the writings of the Arizal, he speaks about all of your tefillahs, Shachrit, Mincha, Marv, throughout the week. And then he goes on and speaks about those same tefillahs on Shabbos. And then he says, well, what is the highest point of the whole week? What is not the highest tefillah, but what is the highest point where is the greatest revelation of God in tefillah? He says during Musaf of Shabbat, when you are doing Chazara, 
and you are in the second part of it, and you say, Ayeh, Makom, Kevodo. Where are you? Keter, exactly. That's what the Arizal says. Why does it start with Keter? We're putting the crown on you. Because the highest revelation of God is when you don't see Him at all. And then you say, where are you? And by saying, where are you? Automatically, you rectify that space. You elevate that space. And you can find God in that space more than you can find Him anywhere else. I'll give you an example, just so it's not so... Uh... Yeah. Uh, I've told this story in the past. I'll tell it again because it's tremendous chizik. When I started doing tshuva, obviously, you know, if you really care, there's a lot of life changes that you have to make. Some of them come more gradually, and for some people, they take them on quicker. One of those things is guarding your eyes. Not push it when you grow up watching porn for 20 straight years. Or even if you're not, and you just watch TV, which is essentially the same thing. It's the most normal thing in the world to see people without their clothes on. That's how we grow up. So for you to stop doing that is not easy. And I remember I was going out with my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now. And she grew up modern Orthodox. So in that case, it gets a little bit tricky because they keep Shabbat and they keep kosher. But when it comes to what they see, they may not be as makbi. So it was, uh, very, it was becoming very difficult for us to find stuff that we like doing that's kosher, that I felt comfortable with. It wasn't easy. She was my girlfriend at the time. And then eventually I said, you know what? Uh, she wanted to go to Miami. And so when we went to Miami, she said, okay, I'm going to go to the beach. And I said, okay, um, can't really come. So she didn't give me a hard time. She respected me, but she also wasn't going to not go to the beach. She's in Miami. So she went. And I'm sitting there at home, in the home that we're staying in by myself. And at this time, I was also very sick. I was suffering from depression for a long time. Because of that, I had tremendous fatigue. I also had tremendous fatigue from the medication I was taking for the, med for the depression, which was not helping me, but I was helping me with being more tired. And so on top of that, I was like here by myself, alone, trying to do this crazy thing by not seeing certain things, even though 99.9% .9 of the world, this isn't even on their radar. Maybe the beach is probably good for me just to go relax a little bit, since I'm not doing that anymore. And now I'm home in this place, and I'm exhausted. So I put on my tefillin, I wrap it as tight as I can, just to keep myself up. And I start to try to learn Torah, because I know that that's what Hashem wants me to do. And so I'm learning Gemara, and I'm trying to read it, and my eyes are rolling in the back of my head. I have my tefillin on, you're not supposed to fall asleep with your tefillin on. So I'm like, I don't even know what to do anymore. I'm literally taking off all my blood circulation to keep myself up so I can learn your Torah. I can't stay up. And because of that, I have to take off my tefillin because you're not allowed to sleep with them on. And I don't know what to do. And I just start crying. I take off my tefillin. I lie down in my bed. And really, really, really in a broken place, I said, Hashem, where are you? I honestly don't know what else I can do. I'm teaching in Queens. I'm learning all day. I'm not going to the beach. I'm not seeing anything. Like, I don't know what other steps I can make. And there's no Yeshua. Not even like a hint of one. I can't even keep my eyes open. And I fell asleep and I had a dream. All the guys who were in my kolel at the time, actually in Queens, were in my dream. One of them, who in person is not very expressively emotional, even though he's a really big sweetheart, he's got a good, good heart. But in person, you would never think of him as someone who is like very emotionally sensitive. In my dream, though, he came up to me and he was crying. And he said, David, do you want to know why you've been sick for so long? And I said, yeah. He said, because you don't wear a Benutam tefillin. 
And then I woke up from my dream and I said, what the heck was that? I don't think I had heard about Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin since like the very beginning of when I started to do tshuva. I think I saw it in the Shulchan Aruch that it said anybody who's Yerat Shemayim is going to wear them. I hadn't heard about it since then. Nobody spoke to me about them. I didn't see anybody with them. And you know, sometimes you have dreams about things that you're thinking about during the day. This definitely wasn't that because I hadn't thought about Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin in like over half a decade. So I'm like, that's so weird. And I went back to Queens, and my first day back in the Kolo, all the Kolo guys were together. I said, guys, I know you're used to me distracting you from your learning, but I have to do it again. You guys got to hear this dream that I had. You're going to bug out. It was crazy. And I started telling them this dream. And like I told you in person, this person is not so emotionally uh, sensitive, so he didn't have much of a reaction. And I said, no, isn't that crazy? He said, why is that crazy? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? You, you told me in the dream that I'm sick because I don't wear a bain with Tom's fillin. That's not crazy? And he said, no, it's a big deal. I said, what do you mean? He said, Rabbi Vadi Yosef like, fought his whole life to get Sephardi guys when they get married to wear a bain with Tom's fillin. I was like, really? And I started looking it up. And I found out that Hasidim, they wear them when they get bar mitzvah. And I'm like, well, what about Ashkenazim? And then I found out that Rav uh, Kenievsky, they asked him, how come you don't wear Rebbeinu Tam Tefillin? Your rabbi did. It was the Chafetz Chaim. So Rav Kenievsky responded that my rabbi, the Chafetz Chaim, only started wearing them when he was 95 years old. He said, when I turn 95 years old, if I have the schut, I'll also start wearing them. And he did. So I get to see that this thing is actually not a small inyan at all. It's something that everybody knows about, except for me. And so I say, Hashem, listen, this is very bizarre, totally off the radar, but I was really in a very dark place and I cried out to you and I had that dream. So if you want me to have Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin because they're going to be good for me, I don't have any money because I'm in Kolel, because I stopped working as a mental health therapist so I can learn Aleph Beit and the Beit Midrash because it's the truth. So I have no money even to pay my bills at the end of the month. If you want me to have them, you're going to have to give me $2,000 because that's how much they cost. Okay. You think you want to get entry level? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe I asked somebody and they told me it was like 1800 bucks or something like that. That week... At that point, I was giving a, a, a chabur in Hasidus in our old shul that I used to pray in. Israel? No, before that. The young Israel with the Sephardi minion. So on Fridays in the morning, I did something on Hasidus. It was the beginning of the week, I forget. Oh no, I did it every morning. And then at the end of the week, he, this person who was the one who asked me to do it, he would give me, I think, like $75 or $100 for like the whole week to do this. That week after this whole thing happened and I was crying in my boat to do to help me if I really need these to give me, you know, $1,800, whatever it was. This person, when he goes to pay me, instead of giving me $7,500, $100, he gave me an envelope. And if anybody knows me, they know that I don't care so much or think so much about money. So I just took the envelope and put it in my pocket and walked on my merry way. And the whole day went by, and I never even thought to look in it. I just assumed he put it in an envelope this time. And as I went to go do Ibo to do that day, my hour that day, as I start pouring my heart out to Hashem, I felt something on my chest. So I'm like, oh, right, the envelope. So I go to open it up, and I don't find any money in there. I find a check for $1,800. So I called this person, because I think this is obviously a mistake. He's supposed to give me 75 bucks, not 1,075, whatever it was. And I called him and I said, um, uh, Ruben, you, you made a mistake. You gave me way more than you're supposed to. And he said, I didn't make a mistake. That's how much I want to give you. And I said back to him, but that's not what we agreed upon. I'm not taking it. Like, tell me if you're home, I'm going to come back and give it to you. He said, David, stop being so arrogant. 
I have to give Mas hair to somebody. This month I want to give it to you. What I do from there, if I was living on my own, obviously I would have just used that money for the tefillin because this is Hashem, no? But I have a wife at home and we're not sure how we're going to pay our bills at the end of the month. So I said to Hashem, listen, there's been a lot of breadcrumbs. <laughs> but if this is really you, when I tell my wife this whole story from the beginning, which I haven't told her any of this yet because I don't want her to think I'm crazy. This is a, uh, a repeating theme in our relationship. <laughs> um, she needs to tell me I can get this instead of using it for our rent. And if she doesn't, I'm not getting them. So I went back. I was like sweating profusely. And I told my wife the whole story. And I thought for sure she was going to tell me, Mapitom, what do you mean, Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin? We have to pay our rent at the end of the month. We finally have money to pay the rent. But she also knows that I've been suffering for a long time. And Baruch Hashem, she also cares about me. She said, David, buy the Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin. Baruch Hashem, I've been wearing them ever since. I had a crazy experience where I went to Uman a few years ago, and I saw this Hasid, Mom is as Hasidish looking as you can get. I never saw a person praying with this level of, I don't know, just realness. I'm watching him as he's shuffling next to the Tzion of the Rebbe for hours, going back and forth like he's arguing with God. I'm like, what is this guy praying for? I have to know. The next day I see him by the Tzion in the morning and he comes over to me and he starts talking to me. And I figure for sure this guy doesn't know a lick of English. And he goes... Rav Kalmus, I have to say thank you so much. I was like, you speak English? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm from America. I said, what do you have to thank me for? He said, I have Rabbeinu Tefillin because of you. I heard your story about Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin with, I don't know if it was Gedali Fenster or whatever it was, or I saw a video of yours, and I bought them, so I just want to say thank you. He was davening for uh, Zivug. He was having a very hard time getting married. Baruch Hashem, the next time I saw him, he had made Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael and he got his prayers answered. Baruch Hashem, the point is like this. I had a very big Gilui, a very big revelation of God in that dream. And if you start reading Rabbi Nachman's writings and Rabbi Natan's writing, Am Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin, you see that they're not just a big deal, they're a huge deal. In fact, in Rabbi Nachman's testament before he died, he said two things. One, you have to learn Shulchan Aruch every day. Two, you have to wear a Beinu Tam Tefillin. Those were his last words. How did I have that dream? How did I have that dream? Because I said, Aye, where are you? And I cried. We have to finish because we're starting our Vite now. And if anybody wants, uh, after our Vite, I'm going to stay around for questions for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to New Jersey uh, tomorrow and then to, uh, I mean tonight, and then to, uh, um, to Israel. I just want to say very quickly, we're starting the first ever English-speaking Breast of Yeshiva in two and a half months. We have the place, we have uh, students, we have teachers, we have staff. We have three floors. It's right next to a 24-7 mikvah, a 24-7 minion factory. It's in the mountains, perfect for Ipotadut. We have an amazing Nasi who's heading the whole yeshiva. It's a historic thing for Jews across the world. There is no other place like this, nothing close. My Rabbi Rav Kivak said, if this works in five years, you're gonna have a thousand students. So I'm not gonna ask you for anything, but I'm just gonna tell you, if anybody wants an amazing opportunity, Please be in contact with me, and we'll talk, okay? Everybody have an amazing night. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you take these things with you. We're going to pray our beat now. Uh, I just want to say that this class is a refuah shlema. Sorry, this is for somebody. One second. This class is a refuah shlema for... For Moshe ben Zevo. And, and for Yosef ben Larissa. Amen. Thank you so much.